Hi, everybody, and welcome back to our Coping with Crisis series. We're studying the topic of anxiety, and we're now going to look at um, the aspects of anxiety about identifying and catching the foxes. And the reason I use that phrase is there's a passage in the Song of Solomon in chapter 2, verse 15, and it's talking about the relationship between the Shulamite and Solomon. And it says, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. And obviously, in that relationship between the Shulamite and Solomon, it was referring to anything um, that would damage this tender relationship, um, which was metaphorically used as little foxes that come in and they, they ruin the vines um, and take the grapes and, the, you know, the, the vines have tender grapes and these foxes go in there and devastate them and uh, cause problems to the vineyard. So that, that term is used metaphorically for don't allow anything to damage our relationship, basically, is what um, that passage is talking about. But the principle can be applied to various aspects of things. So metaphorically, um, these little foxes, so to speak, can affect us. And in the area of anxiety, you have to identify these little foxes. And the little foxes are what we call triggers, uh, whether it's internal or external. And we have to catch these foxes so that these triggers don't allow us to go into full-blown anxiety, that we get to stop it before it starts. But the thing is, you have to be able to identify the foxes. And again, the metaphor I always use from the scriptures is this concept of having a watchtower and you're in the watchtower, and around you is a vineyard, and uh, you're in charge of the vineyard. So let's metaphorically say the vineyard is you, okay? You're in the watchtower, and your job in the watchtower is not to allow critters to come in to the vineyard and ruin the vineyard like the little foxes. So you have to spot the little foxes as, uh, as they try to come in and invade your vineyard. And this is what's happening even with anxiety. We're allowing things to come into our lives that trigger us, that cause us to be set off. Now, ultimately, what we want to do is identify triggers, but ultimately, we want to get the truth to how we're thinking. Because the reason we're being triggered is because we're thinking wrong. And we've talked about catastrophizing and blowing things out of proportion and stuff like that in previous episodes. But we want to make sure we, we can identify what sets us off, catch the foxes, and then let's talk about today um, the counterfeit measures we usually take um, when these foxes come in and we have an anxiety uh, attack or something's causing us anxiety, um, let's talk about how not to go to counterfeit ways of dealing with anxiety. Because at the end of the day, the way you change anxiety is the way you think, the way you believe. That's where it comes down to. It comes down to what you believe in, okay? But we can use these other mechanisms that kind of soften the blow of anxiety but they never solve the problem. They make us feel good temporarily, but they never really solve the problem because we have to change our belief system. So with that being said, let's first deal with the foxes, the triggers, so to speak, that invade our lives. And let's, let's start identifying them, okay? So we can have physical reactions to things that are happening to us. We can have emotional reactions. We can have... Um, cognitive reactions, our thinking gets distorted. There's a lot of things that can happen to us, but let's just talk about physical reactions. And we've talked a little bit about this, but the physical reactions to triggers is that we start having chest discomfort or pain in our heart. We think we're having a heart attack or you can get an elevated heart rate. Um, some people thinking about what causes anxiety, they start trembling or they start shaking. Um, they might have shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, 
Um, they, might, they might start having muscle tension, tension headaches, and their neck gets real tight and stuff like that. Other people get nauseated. They get an upset stomach because of the anxiety. They feel sick. Uh, other people react to the triggers to the little foxes by getting lightheaded. They sometimes faint. They get dizzy. Uh, other people get weak and unsteady. They have to sit down, stuff like that. Other people react by getting the feeling of being hot or warm. And then they start getting sweaty chills. Uh, some people will get hot flashes. Some people have difficulty swallowing. Uh, they'll have a choking sensation or even the dry mouth. So it's not, sometimes they carry uh, around with them water all the time. You ever see people just constantly carrying water around them? It's typically because they're dealing with anxiety, even though they don't know it. But suffering from dry mouth, it's a, it's a source of comfort to carry water for some people. Anyway, those are the physical reactions to these triggers, these foxes that come into our, our vineyard. And, and basically, what happens is um, when these physical things happen, what we have to do in order to catch the foxes, we have to start asking ourselves, what are we afraid of? When these things are happening to us and we're having these anxiety attacks, physical manifestations of anxiety, what is it that we're afraid of? See, that's one way to stop the fox is you see the foxes, but what do you, why are you afraid of the fox? And the idea is, what am I afraid of? Because uh, the issue of, a, of anxiety is fear. Okay? Now, we are thinking wrong, but it causes the emotion of fear. Fear of what could happen to us in the situation. Uh, you know, and we always give worst case scenarios, right? A fear of the future, something that's threatening us, something that's threatening our kids, something that's threatening our, our livelihood, whatever. And we take it to the nth degree, we catastrophize, and then we believe that we don't have the ability to handle it. And it's too big for us, and this thing's going to destroy me, this is going to destroy my life, and uh, life will never be the same. Okay, that kind of distorted thinking happens because of fear. So that something is threatening you or your future or somebody you love, right? And so then we just go into this grossly over-exaggeration of the likelihood that whatever we're thinking, that the likelihood of it happening is like 100%. It's going to happen. I'm going to die, whatever. And you start jumping to conclusions you start becoming myopic on the situation. You don't get a broader perspective. And you become overly emotional. And uh, people can't calm you down. And, and, and all of that turns into a disaster for us. And then hence the anxiety that comes from that. And, and, uh, and of course, counselors that look at this, secular or biblical counselors call this Threat-related thinking. Threat-related thinking. And again, threat-related thinking um, is a distortion of reality. Now, obviously, there are threats in our society. There are threats anytime you go outside, right? But to think you're going to go outside and something terrible is going to happen to you if you go outside, um, that's threat-related thinking. And that's what causes anxiety. Um, and then what happens is in order to relieve this anxiety, the, the person will do something to relieve it. Most of the time, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the person will seek to try to control the situation. Now, what do you mean? Well, if they're afraid that they step out of the house and someone's going to rape them, they won't leave the house. If they're afraid that they go to the grocery store and someone's going to attack them at the grocery store in the parking lot, they won't go. They just won't go. So the way they control the situation is by avoiding. They'll withdraw. They'll try to look for routes of escape all the time. Um, or they'll use some other type of coping mechanism. But anyway, they will try through the coping mechanism to control the situation to make themselves feel good. So if they don't like crowded rooms, they will sit by the door so that way... If something goes down and the roof 
caves in, they can escape out the door. Or if they go to a movie theater and they don't like the crowds or afraid that someone's going to come in and shoot them, um, they will sit by the exit. Stuff like that. And that's all about trying to control the situation, right? They want to get trapped or whatever. Um, and again, none of this really ha helps a person. It calms them down a little bit, but it never changes the distorted thinking that's going on upstairs. So let's, let's do this. Let's talk a little bit about our controlling of things to reduce our anxiety, okay? Because uh, this is a big issue. Let's, number, let's talk about this. Number one, the reality is we don't really have a lot of control of our lives. Now, we can control ourselves. We can control our behavior. We can control our reaction to things. But we can't control all the stuff that's going on around our lives. We can't control what's go what the government's doing. We can't control what the neighbors are doing. We can't control what's happening at the schools where our kids go. There's a lot of things that are completely out of our control. And um, obviously, that is very disturbing for a person who's looking to have control to reduce the anxiety. We have no control of the future. Yeah, you can set your plans out and kind of plan for things, but you really have no control over it. Uh, you need to plan. You need to you prepare. But at the end of the day, how much control do you really have? You know, you, you could go outside and, and be raptured today, you know. So we don't have a lot of control of the future. We don't have a lot of control of the environment around us. And that's the reality. What we are supposed to do as Christians is understand that God has the control and that we can trust him with that control. We need to give up, up trying to control the situation, trying to control people, trying to control the environment, trying to control the future, and give that over to God. Because he does have the capabilities of controlling things, of controlling uh, environments, people, future, and whatnot. So that's, as a believer, what you have to do. You have to give the control over to God. But again, people are so ingrained with trying to subside their anxiety, giving control up is a very difficult thing to do. Even the fact that, that when you tell them, give the control to God, they still have a hard time doing that. They think everything will go haywire if they do that. So it's really down to a theological problem, as you can see. They're trying to control things, but they won't give the control to God. So that's what we have to start doing. And understand that the things we're trying to control, it's an illusion if you think you're, you're tr that you can control them. It, it, it's not in reality. Uh, again, like I said, we can control our behavior, our reactions to things. We can somewhat plan. But again, you don't have a lot of control. We don't have a lot of control. And once you realize that and accept that reality, then you can trust God for the control. So, it comes down to a thinking issue, a believing issue. Do you and I believe that God can control things for the good of me, for the good of you? Okay, so That should theologically reduce anxiety. Because God's in control. I can just give it to God. And that, that takes the burden off my shoulders. So when the scriptures say, cast your anxieties before him because he cares for you, that's how you do it. Stop trying to control things. Give it over to him, and that will take the burden off your shoulders. So anyway, that's one of the issues. Let's go to the next issue. So this is number two. Since control is illusionary, it's not real, um, control then becomes a sugar stick for a lot of people. It, because control, even though it's an illusion, gives the person some type of counterfeit relief. You know? And I know it sounds crazy, but there will be people that have to have their house immaculately clean and in, everything's got to be in place. There's nothing out of whack in their house. And they'll clean their house two, three times a day. The reason they're doing that because it subsides their anxiety because what's going on outside and how they feel is out of control, but at least they can control what's going on in their house. And they do that by, by uh, you know, meticulous controlling of the environment inside their house. That's an illusion, okay? 
That's an illusion. So they create this environment where they think everything's uh, controlled, every T is crossed, every I is dotted in their home, but it's an illusion. It gives them a certain amount of feeling. So what happens is if they have kids, the kids mess up the house and they lose control. They start feeling like they've lost control. And so you don't, they don't want the kids to play because their kids are going to make a mess. And, and so living in that kind of environment as a kid, uh, I can tell you this, you could probably want to get out of there as soon as possible because living under a control freaks regime where they don't even let you play, they don't even let you just have fun because they're so worried about things being in order. Mm, not a good environment, but it's obviously there's a lot of moms and a lot of dads that are like that, and it's because they're fighting anxiety. So, what we have to understand is you can play the game of giving yourself a counterfeit thought that you have things under control, but it's just a counterfeit. The use of worldly things, like having things in order, um, it will temporarily stop the anxiety, but it's just a quick fix. It's a shortcut. Um, if you if you deal with anxiety by like withdrawing or avoidance or escaping or some type of addiction, they might give you temporary relief, but it never solves the problem. The anxiety is going to come back because you're thinking wrong, you're believing wrong, and so these counterfeit reliefs never solve the problem. So here's what I want to do. I want to go through counterfeit reliefs about um, how we try to solve our own problems of anxiety but don't really solve the problem. And this comes from Dr. David Clark and Dr. Aaron Beck and they gave a list of things that people do to try to relieve anxiety. And again, it gives temporary relief but it never solves the problem. So when we go through this list, ask yourself, am I doing any of this? Right? Am I doing any of this as a counterfeit relief? So we talked about identifying the triggers, the foxes. Now we're talking about using counterfeit reliefs. Okay, so number one, people will try to physically relax. They'll do muscle relaxation techniques, controlled breathing. And, and just as a Christian, the controlled breathing thing, be careful because that goes into Hinduism and centering and yoga and weird stuff like that. And you can get yourself in a spiritual mess by doing things like that. But let's just talk about this physical relaxing. Uh, you feel like you have a lot of anxiety, but so I'm, I'm going to go out and physically relax. That will maybe calm things down a little bit, but it's temporary because physical, physical relaxation doesn't affect how you think. Okay. Two. You can start avoiding and withdrawing. We talked about that before from situations that trigger anxiety. Okay, you can do that and that gives you some sense of control, but it doesn't solve the problem. Three, you can leave situations whenever you feel anxious. You walk into a room, you don't like it, and you just leave. Okay, you can do that, but it doesn't solve the problem. Or how about this, taking prescription medication. You can start doing that. And sometimes that, that temporarily helps. But again, does the medication cre uh, uh, create in you a different type of thinking? See, medication is good at, for some, some things. But if it's just a cover-up for distorted thinking, the medication is never going to change anything. You might feel good, but it's never going to change the way you think. Or how about this, seeking reassurance and support from a spouse, a family member, or friends. Now, in biblical terms, it's good to reach out to people. But if you're reaching out to people like your spouse, family, or friends, just to get reassurance that, okay, everything's okay, everything's okay, that still is a temporary issue. Because your spouse, your family, or friends may not have the capabilities to tell you you're thinking wrong. And we need to and, and they may not possess the capabilities to show you how to stop thinking like that. Now they can come and pat you on the back and give you a hug and say there, 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 everything's gonna be okay, but that doesn't stop the wrong thinking. 
And then other people engage in compulsive rituals. And you start seeing this compulsive behavior that starts coming from them, uh, like checking things multiple times, washing their hands, or washing things multiple, multiple times, or counting things multiple times, flipping on light switches off and on, checking doors constantly. That's now a compulsive ritual that helps them feel better, but doesn't solve the problem. Or they distract themselves with activities. Um, they just stay busy. Again, that doesn't change the thinking. Or they suppress their feelings. They hold down their feelings. Again, doesn't solve the problem. Or they use alcohol, marijuana, or they'll turn to smoking or street drugs or whatever. And again, the drugs might feel, make them feel good. The marijuana makes them feel good. Maybe it takes away the anxiety temporarily, but it doesn't solve the problem. Or they get very emotional or tearful. Or they have anger outbursts. Or they become physically aggressive. Or they speak or act more quickly in a hurried manner. Or people become quiet and withdraw from others. Or they go seek medical or professional help, like going to the emergency room because they have uh, uh, pain in their chest. And then when they get checked out, they're saying, it's nothing, there's no heart problems. But going and seeking professional help or medical help relieves the anxiety temporarily. Or they jump on the internet. And, or chat with friends on the internet, or obtain information on the internet, or they become glued to YouTube and glued to all of the stuff that's going on in, on the internet, and they escape through that to relieve anxiety. Again, doesn't solve the problem. Or they'll say, I'm gonna, I just need some rest. I just need to take a nap. We all probably need to take a nap, and we all probably need to rest, but that doesn't change the way you think. Or they'll go into addictions like gambling, um, or they'll get into uh, pleasurable activities, sometimes that are good, sometimes they're illicit, whatever. They'll, f they'll start engaging in pleasurable activities. Um, they'll start eating comfort food. That's why they start gaining weight. Um, they'll start eating their favorite junk food to ease the anxiety. Or they'll seek some place that makes them feel safe and not anxious. That's what happened on the, our, our college campuses where these kids... Uh, or having so much anxiety, they had to have a safe space because we can't have differing opinions and they got to have Play-Doh and puppies and uh, a place where they can't hear other opinions because they feel unsafe. Um, that's because of wrong thinking that's causing anxiety. Look, there is no place that's safe here on, in, in the world. Um, you can pretend that there are, but there's not. Or how about people just vegging out on TV and watching movies and just doing movie marathon days, getting lost in movies and TV. It's a way of uh, getting rid of anxiety temporarily, but it doesn't solve the problem. Or doing something that's relaxing. Take a warm bath or a shower, or get a massage. Still doesn't change your thinking. Seek out a person who makes them feel safe and not anxious. Okay, what if that person does have, have the ability to Say, you're thinking wrong. It's not going to help. Do nothing. And just let the anxiety burn itself out. Okay? You can see the problems there. Engage in physical exercise. Hey, we all need physical exercise. But physical exercise will not change the way you think. Or how about this? Um, go shopping, buying things. Uh, a lot of people engage in doing that. Well, does that change the thinking? Deliberately try not to think about what is making them anxious or worried. Well, here's the deal about that. The more you think about, I can't think about this, I can't think about this, the more you think about it. That doesn't work. Or how about this? Just telling yourself, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to turn out fine. Everything's going to be fine. Just telling yourself lies to make yourself feel good doesn't change anything. Or try to rationalize the anxiety. Well, everybody has anxiety. I'm no different. And so you downplay it doesn't solve the problem. Try to distract yourself by thinking about something else. Okay, you can do that. doesn't solve the problem. All right, but trying to replace anxious thoughts with a more positive and comforting thoughts. You can do that. It's not going to solve the problem. Or making critical or negative remarks to myself. 
about being anxious. You know, you beat yourself up for being anxious. I'm so stupid. I can't believe I'm a fool for believing all these things. Doesn't solve the problem. Or how about this? Ruminating and, and, and just con constantly thinking about anxious thoughts or worrying. And you keep going over it in your head over and over again about what happened in the past or what could happen in the future, or what's happening now, and just sitting there ruminating on it. Actually, that causes you more anxiety. Or how about this? Try to suppress the feelings um, so that I don't look nervous or upset when I'm around people. Or how about this? Like we talked about earlier, being a control freak. Well, to calm my anxiety down, I'm just going to control my environment. I'm going to tr try to control other people. I'm going to control everything I possibly can. And, and again, this is a long list of things I want you to look at and diagnose. That, am I doing any of this? And to realize, oh my goodness, none of this, none of the techniques I'm employing solve my anxiety. It takes it away temporarily. It's a shortcut, but it doesn't solve my problem. So let's talk a little bit more about this controlling of the environment. We started that conversation. I gave you the list, but let's, let's talk a little bit more about this control. Our decision about life in general is going to be based, if we're trying to deal with anxiety, will be based on getting the maximum control of our situation. And we'll use this to minimize our anxiety. And so, Life is going to become very distorted if you and I do that. Because we're seeking a counterfeit security and a safety and assurance and stability and comfort and personal peace by controlling things. And that's not how you get all of that. All of that security, safety, assurance, stability, comfort comes from God, not from us trying to control the environment. That is the shalom that God gives when you have a personal relationship with Him. It's not, it's not coming from us trying to meticulously control every aspect of our lives and other people. And, and if we stay on this course, you're going to fight anxiety for the rest of your life because you simply can't control everything. You have to give that up. Um, and this, you got to understand that we can't live this way. You don't want to keep living with this meticulous control because it, it, it makes the people around you miserable and it, it, it just will continue to stress you out. You won't be able to live as you were created. And basically what's going to happen is because of avoidance, withdrawing, removing yourself from situations, afraid of engaging new things because you, you feel you're going to lose control, what's going to happen spiritually is this. You will bury your talent. And what I'm referring to is Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. The one he gave five, to the another one he gave two, and to the another one he gave one. If you're trying to control anxiety by meticulous control, you will be like the guy who buries his talent and did nothing with their life because they're so afraid of losing control and having anxiety. So they don't ever try anything new. They don't ever try to serve God at a higher level because they're too afraid. They're afraid of crowds. They're afraid of looking bad. They're afraid of this. They're afraid of that. It's, the, it's, it's operating on fear. Fear and control. And that kind of person doesn't become all that God wants them to be. They don't use all the gifts and talents and treasure that God gives them. So in effect, they go and bury their talent. And they never become what God intended them to be. So we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be that guy. Okay? So it comes back to this. What are you thinking about? So what's triggering you should cause you to go back in your head and start wondering, okay, how am I perceiving this? Am I perceiving this wrong? Am I not thinking straight? Am I catastrophizing? Am I thinking that I don't have the ability to cope with this? Am I thinking these distorted thoughts? Is, is the world black and white to me? 
it, you know, that kind of stuff that we've talked about previously. And you have to start nailing that down because what starts happening is these thoughts are not in reality. These thoughts that we have, that we believe, because it's a belief system, are nothing but lies. And we're perceiving or misperceiving the world as it is. And so we're believing lies. That's what it comes down to. Anxiety is caused by wrong beliefs. That's what it comes down to. So in order to change our anxiety, our reactions to things in our world, we have to change our belief system. So check out the foxes. Look at the foxes. What is triggering you? And then work backwards from that and say, why do I feel threatened? What is it that it's making me think? And that will start telling you your misbeliefs. So for instance, if the foxes come into your vineyard and you start saying to yourself, uh, man, I'm going to catch a deadly disease and die, or all my plans for my kids will be ruined, or, or I'll be fired. Or, or people will make fun of me. Or people will reject me. I will be abandoned and left alone. People will make fun of me. Um, what if I get into a terrible accident? What if I get trapped here? What if I have a heart attack? What if I can't sleep? What if I get fired? People will know something is wrong with me if they see my expression on my face. So I got to hide my face. I got to bury my feelings. See, all of that stuff right there, that's irrational thoughts. That's devoid of reality. And they're devoid of logic. And they do not, because they're not in reality, they do not warrant the reaction that we are giving them through anxiety. You're letting wrong thoughts have power over you. The only person we're to allow power over us is God not wrong and distorted thoughts. And don't think for a moment that Satan is not using what you're doing against you. He will use it against you in the spiritual warfare. And so what's happening is we're creating a distorted view of reality and Satan will capitalize on that. And we get into these hypotheticals that probably 98% of them are not going to happen. So, we have to wake up to the fact that we are thinking and believing wrongly. And, and it's distorting reality. And so when reality is distorted, we are going to misperceive the foxes. We're going to misperceive what they're doing. And it's going to trigger us. And we're going to have the anxiety. And the anxiety stems from what we believe. So we're going to start this journey about correcting how we think and how we believe to stop our anxiety. All right. Well, that brings us to our conclusion. Join us next time as we continue this discussion in the world of anxiety, and hopefully we can get healthier as we understand the truth about things. All right. Well, God bless you. We'll see you next time.